I love that too. Yeah. Hey everyone. I'm here with Heidi from Evolve Your Wedding Business. She also has Evolve Your Wedding Business podcast. She's going to be talking about her book, Clone Your Best Clients. So hey, Heidi, so excited hey. to have you. Can you let my, my group know who you are? Yes. And thank you so much for having me. Great to connect okay. with you. I am a wedding business and marketing strategist. So I help wedding professionals grow their businesses without going crazy in the process, <laughs> which is pretty important because it's easy to do. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, do you want, shall I go into a full background or? Let's talk about um, your podcast. I know. Yeah. Good. And probably some people in my group, if they're watching, they'll be like, oh, she has that podcast. So go ahead and talk. Can you talk a little bit more about like who you have on your podcast and like what you talk about on it? Yeah. So the podcast is really focused on all of the different facets of business for wedding professionals. So I have had uh, financial professionals on there. I've had SEO experts on there. Um, really everything in the spectrum. I've actually had a nutritionist on there talking about how to give your brain the fuel you need in order to actually function oh. as an entrepreneur. <laughs> Which is really interesting because he's like totally into the science of it. And I mean, I've started following his stuff in it. You feel good in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Who wait, who has been the biggest person? We'll get we'll get to your book, but who has been the biggest person you've had on your podcast? Because I've seen some pretty big names. Yeah, um, I've had Alan Berg on. I've had Marley Major on. Um Oh my gosh, I've had so many different people on. I've had Brian Caparici of uh, Sprouting Photographer on. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've now had I a lot of different people <laughs> on, and we're creeping up on 100 episodes. <laughs> That's so, how long has the podcast? Do you do like seasons with the podcast, or does it just run continuously? No, I, I started it before seasons were a thing in podcasts, and I kind of wish they were because I think it's a good idea. Yeah. But, um, no, I started it and initially I was doing it every week. So I think I started it about two years ago. And then I switched to alternating between a podcast week and a blog post week. Yeah. So that way it spaced out that kind of content creation and made it easier to batch interviews and batch solo episodes together. Yeah. How did you go about selecting wedding professionals to work with? Like why wedding professionals? So my event background actually goes back to when I was in college and I was working on nonprofit events, fundraising events. And because they're nonprofits, I wasn't just in charge of the event. I was in charge of the marketing. Yeah. So it was both pieces rolled into it. I loved it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to work in nonprofit events. So I, I went and I had some great experiences with that. Yeah. And then I saw an assistant position for a wedding planner. Mm -hmm. And I started working in that and I loved it. But, oh, man, I respect you wedding planners. Not for me. <laughs> we respect it. Yeah, I really respect that. All the respect in the world. <laughs> I can't do that. I would be the person who's like, mm, maybe don't freak out about that because it's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Check your reality here. But, um. From there, I, I mean, I ended up moving to England, where my husband's from, and I was just working in all sorts of different marketing positions in different industries. And I noticed there was a gap in the market over there between what people were doing and what the wedding media and bridal shows were actually putting out there. So what they were putting out there was very, like, white and fluffy and traditional and feminine. And what people were really leaning towards was like an offbeat bride, rock and roll bride, like very personal to who they are and their style and incorporating that. So I decided to start the Alternative Wedding Fair in London to bring together these awesome quirky couples and these awesome quirky vendors who, I mean, some of the dressmakers, one of them had worked in the West End, which is like British Broadway and costuming wow. so they were like these beautiful beautiful like stage worthy pieces yeah uh, 
There was one woman who worked with paper, but laser cut it with such precision. She was able to make like accessories and dresses and you wouldn't know they're made out of paper. They were incredible. That's awesome. So I found I was actually spending more time coaching my exhibitors because I'm a marketing nerd and I just read marketing books. And I was like, oh, hey, not everybody just is into this stuff, which is like a huge slap in the face. Like, duh, Heidi. Mm -hmm. But that's when I realized I needed to bring this marketing area of my life and this wedding and event space together in order to help that industry because I saw these amazing, amazing, talented people who if they were paid on their talent, they'd be millionaires. Yeah. But it was getting in front of clients, booking clients that they were struggling with and right. oh, they shouldn't have been based on their work. But if you don't have that, you know, that marketing and business piece, it doesn't all come together. No. Yeah. I think we see that with a lot of like probably a lot of people in this group, Kimberly, that, if you like, they can be so creative. I've seen my clients that can be so creative and so talented, but if you're missing that, like that little part of your brain, that's like, this is how you work it. This is how you do business. Then you're like, I have no idea. Yeah. How do you get people to pay you for it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks so much for that. So tell us about your book. That's so it's, it's up. It's for sale, right? Yep. Your book. Okay. And it's called clone your best clients. Yes. So the the thesis of the book is that the traditional idea of the ideal client avatar, while it's somewhat useful, doesn't tell you what to do to okay. get more of those people. So the idea with this book is to really identify who your best clients are and then oh. build your marketing around them. So the people you wish you could clone and just keep on working with over and over and over again, mm-hmm. that's who you want to market to. Very cool. So this is different than the typical avatar thing that yeah. we talk about. Okay, cool. So how it, so how is it different from like the typical avatar thing? Like you have a client and then go ahead and tell me more about yeah, that. Yeah, so... Uh, it takes people if you're identifying who their absolute best people are that they really want to continue working with. And then it takes people through a process to really look at them as a whole human being, because we really often silo off our clients. They're brides, they're brides between this age group in this area, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of different people in that demographic. Like there's a lot of different 30 year old women. There's a lot of different 25 year old women in the world. And Mm -hmm. you have to market to the person's values. You can't just Ah. do the marketing stuff. So I take people through a process of actually interviewing your best clients in order to really pull the marketing intelligence out of them and to get the language that they're using and you know more information about them as a person and why they're making the decisions that they're making so that you can base your marketing around that. Huh. Oh, that's really cool. All right. Yeah. So so we kind of got a little bit of an idea of what it is, but like why would why do you think wedding professionals should spend the time on doing it? So when you really think about the role that this plays, it's definitely worth your time. So it's the foundation of everything that you're doing in your business. If your marketing isn't built on really knowing your ideal client, not as like a weird siloed off demographic or like a weird amorphous blob of people with no face. If you don't really know who they are and how to connect with them, you don't know how to market to them. You don't know where to market to them. So you're probably spending time in places where they're not looking. You're probably spending advertising dollars in places where they're not looking. Mm -hmm. And you can really make this easier for yourself because they'll tell you how to reach them and they'll tell you, you know, the, the things that make them decide to work with you as opposed to someone else so that you can emphasize that more 
in your marketing and bring in more people ultimately. So should they, so like should a wedding professional, you said that the, they'll tell you, right? Like your wedding client will tell you where they're looking for you or why they hired you. When do you think, like how should a wedding professional ask that? Or like what should they, you know, how do they go about getting that information from a client? Yeah. So initially, I mean, you have to get someone to agree to talk to you about it. And yeah. there's an email template in the book that's worked well for my clients. And really it's based on genuine flattery because you're going to okay. tell them you're amazing. If there were more Shannons in the world that I could work with, I'd be the happiest person on earth. So can I ask you a few questions? Can we jump on a Skype call for like 20 minutes so I can ask you a few questions so I can find more people just like you. Ah, okay. And then they're like, I'm special. I'm going to talk <laughs> about myself. <laughs> that is so cool. All right. So Christine asked the question, what about when clients find me through a wedding planner? And the wedding planner typically acts as the monkey in the middle. So she probably is having a hard time pulling out, like, where these people, like she was saying, probably where these people are finding her and the words that she wants them, she wants to pull out that you were talking about. How could she go? Well, uh, do you know what kind of business she runs? And if she has. Yeah, I know Christine runs a calligraphy business. Okay. So if you don't have direct access, if you're going through the wedding planner for everything, mm -hmm. I would let them know why you want direct access. So and sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if they're your only point of contact, I mean, if you have direct access and you're also working with the client, go ahead and ask them. But I really think if you go through the wedding planner, you let them know what you want to do and why and how they can do it to help mm -hmm. their business as well. I would think most wedding planners would be all right with that. Okay. All right. So Christine, just let us know if that answered your question, but I think she kind of got to basically, you just ask the wedding planner and then you ask the client, right? Is that a yeah. 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 I think, I mean, sometimes the wedding planner is the only point of contact, but sometimes it's, it's a bit of both. So it kind of depends. Awesome. All right, cool. So I have a lot of people that start out and I remember feeling the same way too, that if I, oh, okay. Actually let's address Chris. So Christine just asked the higher end brides, don't want access to all vendors. So should you ask the wedding planner, like, hey, how did this bride describe her wedding? How did this bride describe her values? I would try as best you can to get access to the client after the wedding. So okay. after all that overwhelm and the million things on the task list have passed, because then you're going to be able to ask retrospective questions like uh, what they would say if they were recommending you or the perhaps a planner too that they worked with to a friend and they don't know that necessarily when they're in the midst of it because there's so much going on. So mm -hmm. I would definitely try uh, to get access to them afterward. If you can't, it would be really interesting to see if this is something you can get the planner to do. Okay, cool. I like it. I like it. All right. So the question that I was going to ask, perfect. Christine's happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the question I was going to ask that I was worried about is that I remember starting my floral design business and not wanting to narrow down or niche down that everyone was telling me what I need to do. Like all the gurus, all the marketing books, all the Amazon books I bought on business and everybody else I was listening to. Like now we have webinars and Facebook lives and stuff like that. And some people are probably hearing this and thinking, but if I do that, Shannon, then I'm saying no to more money. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what it goes through. A lot of people's minds is when I narrow down to one specific person, I'm saying no to those other weddings and that more money that I need to make. So what do you think? What would you say to someone who's worried about cutting off other opportunities, other weddings by saying like, I want to specifically work with this type of person. That's a totally valid concern. And I can yeah. see why anyone would think that because it makes logical sense. Right. <laughs> but people aren't logical. <laughs> so you have to definitely keep that in mind. And right. 
you cannot please everybody. Even Apple, you know, the most profitable country, the most a country, I mean, they could be a country, but the most profitable company in the history of the world has people that don't like them. They have people who think that their products are stupid and overpriced and just for, you know, status symbols for the people who uh, like, the, you know, the Apple fanboys who want to be a part of it. So even though Apple has billions, and billions of dollars, they don't try to convert those people because those people are least likely to buy from them. It's going to take more time. It's going to take more effort. It's going to take more money in order to get them to buy something. There's not going to be a return on that investment. They will have spent too much trying to convert someone who's already dug in that mm -hmm. this is who they are. I don't like this brand. This isn't me. Yeah. So in that sense, we were thinking about trying to reach the people who are most likely to buy from you, to work with you. Mm -hmm. it, it will make your life much, much easier. And when yeah. you position yourself as the go-to person for a specific type of client, mm -hmm. you won't just attract that client. You will, certainly, because there will be all the planners and then you, the go-to person for this specific group of people. So you get to charge higher prices because there's no comparison, mm -hmm. but you'll also attract people who are on the fringes of that ideal client. So an example I give in the book, I have a client, she's a wedding planner. She works with um, Americans who are usually first generation and they're the children of typically Mexican or uh, other Central American country immigrants. So she's really specific. Yes. Yeah. And um, so she's the clear go-to person. And the problem she solves is these kids grew up in America. They're very much American, but their heritage is very important to them. So the traditions that matter to their grandmother in the wedding, the yeah. ability to have a ceremony in Spanish, you know, all of these things are really important to them. Mm -hmm. So she stands out among everybody else as this like shining beacon, the only option for these people. Yeah. But she also gets, you know, white girls like me who like bold colors and everything, Mexican yeah. culture. It's more, they're coming for the aesthetic as opposed to the other reason why her actual ideal clients are coming. And she can choose to work with those people or she can choose not to. That's totally up to her if she wants to take on people who are pretty close, but not exact. But you certainly don't have to limit yourself. And by making yourself the go-to person, it's counterintuitive, but it actually opens up more opportunities. Okay. I agree. I do. I totally agree with this. It was like when I narrow down in my floral design business, it was, and I, and I raised my prices to a minimum. I said, I'm only taking like people who have $2,000 minimums for flowers. And you also are having this type of wedding. It was like, then all like the ideal clients came to me and they were just like, yeah, I'll spend yeah. at least two grand on flowers. And I was like, Oh, it was that. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> because I'm sure when they found you or they found your yeah. website, they were like, this is me. This, this is who I need to be working exactly. with. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what I wanted them to say. Like this girl gets me. She understands me. She knows exactly what I want, but here's, here's like a little bit of controversy that I would add in there too. So I got those girls. There would be some girls that would come along and if it was slow, I will admit to this. If it was slow in my business, I would take people who weren't ideal clients, but I wouldn't post them. I wouldn't put it in my portfolio. I really wouldn't put it out as much like on my social media. I might do like a small thing, but I would take, so I understand where some people are like, I just need to pay the bills. I probably would take a couple, a few, but not, it wouldn't be like 80% of my wedding were not ideal weddings, but I would take maybe like 20% of weddings I would take are not ideal clients, but Hey, I needed to like pay my cell phone bill or something. Right. So like I would take them on and then not put them in my portfolio. What do you think I about think that? That makes perfect sense because yeah. you're crafting a brand, you're crafting something that shows 
what you stand for and who you're the go-to person for. So, I mean, first of all, there was something about that that they were attracted to, but in particular for, uh, for businesses that are very aesthetic based, like photographers, like florists, Mm -hmm. if that doesn't fit with the rest of what you're using to promote yourself, don't use it. Use yeah. what you want more of. Right. Perfect. Okay, cool. So let's talk about now how most people figure, you know, about their ideal clients is whoever is getting married within my town. <laughs> like, like if you are bride getting married within a certain mile of radius in my town, that's whose wedding I'm going to do. Why is that not like narrow enough? Like, why isn't that just enough, right? Because you already cut it down by a lot when you say yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. And I get that. Like, there is there's some specificity to it. You're not marketing to the whole world. Yeah. But there's a lot of different people in your town. There's a lot of different mindsets. There's a lot of different worldviews. There are the people who shop at Whole Foods. There are the people who shop at Walmart. And their opinions. Oh God, that's a good example. Their opinions and the way that they spend money, they're just different. It's not yeah. a value judgment, like who's better, who's worse. They're just different. They're just different people. Yeah. And when you really can hone in on the, that exact person and their personality, and I think that's what often gets left out, is we think about this group, it's actually easier for our brains to focus on a person, preferably a person we've worked with or a person that we know or a person that we've talk to in some capacity because there's just some disconnect with the human brain that groups are not people. They're just these weird disconnected groups. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about a single person that you know in that group, you can actually have empathy for them. So when it comes to narrowing down, I mean, there's two sides to it. There's bringing people to you. So standing out among your competition as the go-to person. But then there's also the internal side of that. And those are things that help you really find your way. They're your compass. So it helps you to determine where to advertise. It helps you to determine where to market and how to market. Because when you look at, like I said, Walmart and Whole Foods, the way they promote essentially their same things, food, very different. Very different. The language they use to command the prices that they pay, they speak to the motivations of the people. So a really good understanding actually helps you figure out what you're supposed to be doing and how to bring in more of these people as opposed to being like, ah, I need to, I need to be on Snapchat, but none of your ideal clients use Snapchat. (laughs) So Heidi, do you have any advice for someone who say like doesn't know who their ideal client is yet? Maybe they haven't either they haven't worked with them yet. Um or they just feel like they're they're getting clients but maybe not the ideal clients and they're not sure like how to describe that person because they've never worked with them. Would you have any advice for that? Yeah, so if you know someone either just outside of business in your life that you believe will be, and you need to make some assumptions here and you can always test them that you believe will be somewhere around your ideal client. Or, you know, if you go looking around in Facebook groups and you get talking to someone who you feel is very much the kind of person that you want to be working with, Uh huh. That is a very helpful person to talk to. And keep in mind, like this isn't something that you have to decide in your business and you can never change. It will probably change. So making some educated guesses. Yeah. Yeah. So making some educated guesses, especially if you have people you've worked with that, you know, you don't want to work with again. Yeah. What was it about them? What was it about? maybe the way they thought about things, uh, just how did they operate as a person will really help. And it's totally fine to just start with an assumption because really everything we do in business is an experiment Yeah, and you have to just try it and test it. 
I think like I think most of us, I know when I work with some clients before who are like, how do I get the brides that want to spend a lot of money on their wedding? But like sometimes it can be tricky because you can't ask people like what's yeah. your salary? <laughs> you know, like you can't ask that. So I think that one can be tricky when you're like, how do I find the bride that's gonna spend like a shit ton on her wedding? But I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know what they would look like. What do you think? Like, what are your ideas? Like, what do you think the bride who spends a lot of money looks like? I think we tend to see, this is like the whole thing with groups again. I think we tend yeah. to think of people who have more money than us as like people walking around acting like they're in a perfume commercial all the time and talking <laughs> that way. And they're like, Oh, darling. No, <laughs> <laughs> they're still just people and really it comes down to what you value and the personality so someone with a lot of money may not yeah. actually value their wedding flowers that much or value uh -huh. their stationery or value spending much money on their wedding because mm -hmm. they want to go travel or something yes so more income does not necessarily equal more spending yeah. it's really finding people who care a lot and really value that specific piece of your what of their wedding so they really really value photography it's really important to them and so we'll spend like a good amount of money on yeah that. and learning yeah. why it's yep. important to them yeah is really really helpful because then you know okay this is how i explain what I'm doing. This is how I explain my packages so that it makes sense to someone who is coming from that motivation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's is funny. I have like, um, I had a bride that spent 10,000. So in the second year of my business, she was spending $10,000 on her flowers. And it was just totally, I mean, she didn't come from like, she, she wasn't a rich person per se. I would say she's probably like middle class or upper middle class, but she fucking loved flowers. Like she loved flowers. So she was like 10 grand on flowers. No problem. Like, like she, I mean, the rest of her wedding was also beautiful and she rented a tent and rented some like furniture and stuff like that. But by far, I think she spent the most on flowers just because she really, really, really loved flowers. <laughs> yeah, it was her priority. It was it was the priority. Yeah, exactly. So Christine said mine started as when we were talking about how to figure out who that rich version of that client would be or, or how to find that bride that will spend a lot of money. She said mine started as a basis of the rich version of myself, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah, because Christine values calligraphy, obviously, because that's what she does. Yeah. And so if she was a rich version of herself, maybe she would spend more money on getting like envelopes, you know, calligraphy for some big events or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then that allows you, you know, if you're the only person you have to dig into at that point in time to dig into your own psyche of like, okay, why do I value calligraphy? What does that mean to me uh -huh. is that I have calligraphy and not just something that's mass printed? Right. Is it the way right. it makes me look to my friends? Is it the way it makes me feel in some way? Like, what is it about it? Why are you so into it? Yeah. All right. So I think that goes good into our next topic of how can you get to know your ideal client better so that you can improve your marketing? So how does all this, how does knowing all this stuff, how does cloning our best client then translated to marketing. I think that's where some people get tripped up like a lot of the times. Like like even my clients, when I've worked with my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients, you know, I've said, we'll really narrow down what does that person look like? And then they'll just come back to me and be like, Shannon, where do I put this? Like, do I put this on my homepage, on my about page? Like, where does yeah. this go on my social media? Like, where does this then go? So you don't look like a weirdo who's like, if you wear these shoes, you should book me. And people will be like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> if you wear those shoes <laughs> it's a good question and it's I get it it's weird you're like okay so I did this work now what so yeah. from there what I get my clients to do is to then go through starting with their website 
their online presence with a fine tooth comb. Okay. So is the language that I'm using on my site, the language that these people just used to describe why they hired me, what they got out of it. You can actually use their real copy and paste language to describe these things. And I think that's really helpful because we're in this every day. And it's mm. easy for us to get jargony about it and to talk about our journalistic yeah. style of photography. But to someone who's never hired a photographer, they don't know what that means. Yeah. What? What does that get me? What does that get me? Yeah. So, you know, actually listening to someone and then going through and saying, does this sound like something that would connect with this person based on what they just told me? based on uh, the things that they're really into as a person. Uh, I just spoke to a photographer who all of his people are really like outdoorsy adventure types. Like they want to go kayaking on the weekend or like mountain biking. So yeah. the visuals on his site match this kind of thing. The photos yeah. of himself match this kind of thing. And mm -hmm. the language that he uses isn't overly flowy and pretentious. It's more direct and to the point and about having fun and adventure. Yeah. So yeah. that it connects to them. Right. Yes. Totally makes sense. I love it. So definitely the way that you communicate in text form and as well as in your visuals need to line up with who this person is. And I actually really like when I see on sites, you know, a direct call out of who the IGEL client is. Mm -hmm. Like if you do this, if you're really into this, if you mm -hmm. really value this, I'm the stationer for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's it. great. Yeah. This can, then, I mean, this can apply to so many businesses, right? Yeah. Like this can apply to all of them. This can apply yeah. to our businesses. This can apply. My clients have other courses they're trying to teach and they're learning like, who should I be targeting this to? Like all of that information. Yeah. They can totally use all of this information. So good. And I do this. I do this in my own business. Anytime yeah. I get stuck, anytime I'm like, okay, I'm going to create this new thing. Mm -hmm. I think I know what people need, but I should probably stop and check yeah. before I go spending a bunch of time on this. And it really helps center me and reposition me and knowing exactly what I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. All right. So you talked a little bit about how one of your clients, how he, you know, figured out exactly who he wants to photograph, which I actually have a friend that's like, exactly like who he said he wants to photo those adventurous couples that go kayaking and stuff. Yeah. One of my friends is exactly that. So I know exactly who he's talking about. So you did an awesome job narrowing down like exactly who he wants to talk to. So what kind of results are people also getting from implementing this whole clone your best client? So from what I've seen, people are definitely bringing in more people that fit who their ideal client is or are in like, if you're thinking of like a, like an archery target, like your ideal clients in the center, the other people that aren't your ideal are like a couple of rings removed, but they're still really, really close and really, really awesome. Mm -hmm. Those are the type of people that these people are attracting. They aren't arguing about price because they're connecting in ways yeah. that, you know, you just spoke to what this person valued. Mm. You dealt with all these concerns and price objections are often more about not understanding the value, not understanding what's in it for them. than they really are about the number. Yes. I really for like sure. That. And Mm -hmm. On top of that, you know, they are able to even raise their prices because they are the go to person for this group of yeah. people. Mm -hmm. And that makes them more sought after. That makes them more desirable. And it makes it harder to compare them to someone else who is another planner, another photographer, because it's not the same. These Here's the person who gets me and has exactly what I want. And here's someone who's like, I don't know, like, I guess just another <laughs> planner or photographer. Another one in the mail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't, they don't make you feel the same way. They don't make you feel understood and connected. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that 
experience that you get when you go to a site and you're like, oh, yes, I am in the right place. <laughs> like, take my money. Like, when the yes. person starts speaking you and connecting with you, it's that's when people like, here, just take my money. You'll do a great job. Here, just take my money. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I think that people want to be a big thing is that people don't want to be sold to. Like, they don't want to feel like they are being pitched to in any way. Mm -hmm. And when you find that ideal client like you're talking about in Clone Your Best Clients, it's talking about, it's it's a connection you're making. So when you are finding that ideal client, it's a connection. It's not, it, that's when the whole sales pitch thing like goes out the window because you're connecting with them, not trying to sell them. Yeah. yeah. And totally. then it's an excitement. It's like, great, where do I sign? How do we get started? What happens <laughs> next? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly that. That's it. All right. Awesome, Heidi. Well, that's all the questions I got for you. But do you want to tell people I'm going to allow you to do a post in the group so you can do a post in the group about the book. Cool. It's it's on Amazon right right yes. now. Best clients is on Amazon for sale. Is it just Kindle version, paperback version? What do you got available? It's both. Okay. Um, so okay. the Kindle version is at a promo price right now of 99 cents through the rest of the day today. Awesome. Yeah, Pacific yeah. time. So you've got like a long time. It's only 10.30 a.m. here. So you're good. You got all day. <laughs> so you can pick that up. And, you know, if you don't have a Kindle, you can read it on other devices with the Kindle apps, like an iPad, a phone, your laptop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's just laughs> um, I have the paperback version, which I just got a copy of myself oh here. My are you gonna frame that? I would frame that shit though. I just opened it and I was like, because <sighs> <laughs> you're like a real legit person. I know it's just sitting here. I'm like, oh, <laughs> hey, pretty. <laughs> so cool. Oh my god, I would frame that thing. I'd frame it like in my office. I'd be like, I. I think I might need to. <laughs> But um, there, there's a little bit of delay of this going onto the Amazon page because of communication between their paperback and their, I don't know, something weird behind the scenes. If you don't see this on the Amazon page, which if you go to Evolve Your Wedding Business, I almost said Evolve Your Best Clients, EvolveYourWeddingBusiness.com slash clone, okay. it'll take you to the correct Amazon page for whatever country you're in the world, in the world and um, if you don't see the paperback, you can go to evolveyourweddingbusiness.com slash paperback and get this beauty because for some reason it takes a while to push it to yeah. Amazon. I don't know. Yeah. Things get big. <laughs> <laughs> like for things to go smooth, I mean, really. Yeah. <laughs> and um, actually for anyone who purchases either version any time between now and uh, May 23rd, forward your receipt to me. My email is Heidi at EvolveYourWeddingBusiness.com, okay. H-E-I-D-I. None of this I before E stuff that I always get. <laughs> but forward your receipt to me. I'll send you a link to register for a readers only Q&A that I'm hosting to help you really understand any parts you're getting stuck on anywhere you know, you're implementing and you're just getting hung up or have any questions at all. I want to make sure that's cleared up so you can take action on this. Awesome. That's so cool. Thanks so much, Heidi. That's yeah. fun. My audience is going to love that. They're going to really love this. This book is going to be like, I know they're already eating it up. Christine already probably bought one. I'm sure she did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Yeah, it's awesome. So it's, it's really great. I'm so happy to have someone in like you in here. And I had another friend earlier, Christy, her name's Christy. And she did um, another one about branding. And I have you guys come in because I don't talk about it too much. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is something though that my clients need to do, but it's not my specialty. So that's why I love having people like you and Christy in the group because you guys can teach them all about this stuff that will make them more money and get brides who are not going to haggle with their prices anymore. So thank you so much for coming in here and sharing your knowledge. So My pleasure. Yeah, everybody, if you're listening, Clone Your Best Clients is for sale right now. I have left a link in the comments. It's only 99 cents. It's like nothing. <laughs> it's like amazing. I figured I out the other day it was one third of the coffee that I bought. <laughs> I was like, hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> so clone your best clients is 99 cents until tonight and then does the price go up yeah the price will go up, but it's only going to be up to 3.99 okay all right cool but that's still still, not bad. I mean, 99 cents is better than 3.99 so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. all right so it's on sale for 99 cents in the kindle store this is Heidi. She's from Evolve Your Wedding Business. She has Evolve Your Wedding Business podcast, and she is the author of the book, Clone Your Best Clients. It has been so awesome chatting with you. Thank you, Heidi. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.